Um, first, I want to thank uh, United Way for inviting me and Lexmark for hosting um, this uh, event. Um, I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about the dropout phenomenon that's going on in the United States and a little bit about Kentucky in, in reference to our dropout crisis. And I'm not quite sure if you're aware of uh, how many children leave our schools on a daily basis uh, prematurely. Uh, and also a program that we have at our church that has been going on for almost seven years now that has com combated and actually been successful in making sure that students graduate and go on to college in conjunction with the United Way, Fayette County Public Schools, and a couple other organizations. So I just want to talk about maybe about 15 to 20 minutes and then we can have a um, uh, question and answers. So the, quick, the what is, um, I always do my presentation, the way I do the same thing I do in my classroom. Uh, I ask folks to chime in, ask questions anytime, and interact, uh, be very interactive. So how I do this is I do what, so what, and now what. What are we going to talk about? So what? Why is this important? What are, you know, what are the implications of this particular issue? How it relates to Lexmark, United Way, uh, faith-based organizations, and schools. And then the now one, which is the most important thing, is what are you going to do about it? Okay? And like I tell my students all the time when I was in Cincinnati, they misbehave. Yesterday you didn't know. Today you know. Tomorrow makes you accountable. Okay? And so the now what is the most important thing. Once we listen to this, what, is our, what do we do as an individual and in the community? The silent epidemic. Uh, the dropout crisis. If you look at this little this uh, paragraph right here, and I'm going to show you know a few numbers, but the graduation rate in general for all students uh, is probably hovering around 68 percent in the United States. Okay, and the opposite of that is looking at dropouts. And you look at Latino students, African American students, many of our urban settings. We have in some places like Memphis and Indianapolis. Uh, Detroit, Cincinnati, where for African American males the graduation rate is maybe like 38, 39 percent. Okay. That's not an exaggeration. That's reported. So sometimes it can be even worse than that. In other words, you know, if, if 200 kids walk in their freshman year, maybe only about 40 or so are leaving four years later. Okay. Uh, so it is an epidemic in most of our urban settings. It's not that bad in Kentucky and in Lexington. Uh, in Louisville, but uh, we still have our own issues. Here's some other data, just real quick, of who's dropping out. Every 29 seconds, another student gives up on school, uh, resulting in more than one million people leaving, uh, high school students leaving every year. Nearly one third of all public high school students and nearly one half of all Americans, Hispanics, and Native Americans fail to graduate in public schools. Now, how many of you all realize that our dropout rate was that alarming in the United States? Show hands. Okay. How did you, what did you, if I said what was the dropout rate for the United States in general, what would you have said? 20 percent? Okay. Anybody over here about the same? Okay. So at least we know you're awake now, right? Because we're talking about with some groups of students, it's well past that. Um, and what happens is the other thing about the dropout rate is that we tend to focus on it in high school, and the dropout rates are kindergarten through 12th grade issue. In other words, they don't wait till their junior year or senior year to decide to drop out. Something happened around third or fourth grade to start this planting the seed, and then by middle school, they come to school physically, but they're not there mentally, and when they're old enough to drop out, they leave. Okay? And so it is a, it's a major issue, not only uh, in the United States, but also in our country. So, so what? Why is this important? Why do we sit here on this day, well, one, because it's cool in here. That's probably why we're sitting in here. Um, the other reason, why, why do we need this? Why is United Way asking us to sit here and have this discussion? Why am I talking to you all about this? And why are you all here? Why other folks are out doing other things during their lunchtime? The so what is that dropouts are more likely than high school, high school graduates to be unemployed, uh, poor health, living in poverty, public assistance. It's a drain on our economy to drain on our, our, our uh, society in general when students leave school prematurely. Okay? It impacts everybody either directly or indirectly. Um, the last one is pretty alarming also. Dropouts are four times less likely to volunteer uh, than college graduates. We're looking, you know, we have United Way. And so there's a better chance if you're a graduate, 
you're uh, gainfully employed that you actually volunteer for an organization. Those who have dropped out, who are not gainfully employed, there's less chance they're going to volunteer. And one of the things that we know is a good strategy for making sure kids graduate is volunteering in schools and things of that nature. Okay. Uh, the other piece is that students, uh, a good majority of the students who are I mean, prisoners who are in, uh, in jail are, are dropouts. And unfortunately, and this is uh, another piece you may not be aware of, in some states, particularly in rural parts of the state, they decide where they're going to build the prisons based on literacy scores of third and fourth graders. Because that we know that you can't read. This is how, this is how literacy works. From preschool to third grade, kids learn how to read. From fourth grade on, they read to learn. And so by third and fourth grade, if you're not reading on grade level, you're going to struggle uh, academically. And if you are retained in grade, uh, in one grade, you have a 50% chance of uh, dropping out. And if you retain two grades, if you're two grades behind, you have about a 60 or 70 percent dropping out of school. And so when kids do not graduate, there's a good chance that many times a lot of those folks actually end up in, in jail also. And if there's a state prison and federal prison, guess who's paying for those, those prisons? We are, right? So all the hard money you earn at Lexmark, that may take away some of your 18-hole golf or shopping at Fed Mall, because that money is going back into the system. And we spent about $6,800 uh, per student in Kentucky, something like that, state funding per year. And it costs about $32,000 to house a prisoner in most state or federal prisons. Okay. So someone may want to go to college and can't get any federal funding or state funding, but you can get all the funding you want if you want to go to prison. Doesn't make any sense. And so the more kids we have graduate, the better chances we're going to actually. So it always impacts one of us, uh, impacts us directly or indirectly. Who makes it through high school? And this is kind of uh, uh, a little dated uh, information. This is 2004, but uh, actually in the last seven years it hadn't changed much. Uh, this is the graduation rate for our students. This is throughout the, uh, the country. Does that surprise anyone? Uh, I'm going to come back to the Asian students in reference to the program that we have at our church. And there's a, a connection there. Now, you see where it says African American, 53%. As I said before, depending on where you live, it can be much lower than that. Okay. And also depending on where you live, it can be higher than that. Also. In uh, Fayette County public schools and Jefferson, Jefferson County public schools are right around 60, 70 percent maybe. Um, Fayette County is a little higher than that for graduation. Overall in Fayette County public schools, our drop our, our graduation rate is a uh, fairly high compared to most uh, school districts that are hovering around forty thousand kids. So we do okay, but the question is, who's that 28% that, that are not graduating? You know, which kids should we sacrifice to say that we're okay? Why do they drop out? Now, I, 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 I want to give you a test. I'll show it to you too quick. Mm -hmm. You know, you know professors, we always got to give the exams, right? So, give me a reason why you think students drop out, even though you're already cheated. Look at the screen. Their parents dropped out. Okay, related to their parents' experience. We know with academics and behavior sometimes that if their parents struggled in school or had bad experiences sometimes, not all the time, but some of the kids, their children have uh, bad experiences also. So it may be uh, parentally related. What else? Peer groups. Peer groups. Who you hang out with. You know, old school, your parents knew exactly who your friends were, where you were, and all that kind of stuff. Now, you know, well, I'm still old school, you know. You go outside, you come back in with the light, lights on, the porch lights on, all that kind of stuff. You know, I got no mind at, at all times. But, you know, who you hang out with? You know, peer pressure is just right below drugs. That's how strong it is. You know, Mark Twain said that when I was 14 years old, I, I couldn't believe how stupid my parents were. But by the time I turned 21, I was amazed how much they had learned in seven years. <laughs> so, so kids think they know everything. They will listen to another 14 year old if they listen to us. Uh, so peers, who else? Drugs. Drugs. Drugs is a big one also. You mentioned reading earlier. 
Huh? You mentioned problems with reading. Literacy. Okay. Financial reasons. Okay. Economic reasons. Okay. Anything else? Harassment, bullying. Okay. Harassment and bullying. Who do you think does more to bully? Girls or boys? Girls. 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 <laughs> I, you know, I always, I always say this, you know, with the hesitancy to sound sexist, but after working in middle school for seven years and then asking female teachers that I'll take a thousand boys in middle school versus 50 girls. <laughs> because with boys will, they'll have a conflict with each other. So they may give each other a black eye. Girl give each, girl, girls give each other eating disorders. Okay? It goes on and on, and they won't see each other 20 years later in Fayette Mall because they had an issue in, you know, like some traditional banks. And so the bullying, and particularly um, uh, the cyber bullying, is, most, is primarily girls and primarily middle school. And so you have a lot of kids avoid coming to school because of the bullying and things of that nature. Anybody else? Any other reasons? Now, you're not going to see all these reasons on here, but those, some of those, those are legitimate reasons. Pregnancy. Okay, teen pregnancy also. And that's why it's important that schools have something in place uh, for girls uh, when that happens. All right, lack of motivation. Um, lack of interest in classes. Some of the kids are just bored. Okay, they are sitting in class. You all remember this. Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. And they're just standing there and the teacher's lecturing and that kind of stuff. So. Some kids are very bored. Um, unwelcome environment, that's one of the things I deal with a lot of, um, in my research and do a lot of training with schools, is school culture. And just like working in Lexmark or anywhere else, you want a culture, organizational culture, you don't mind going in and working and things of that nature, right? Schools are the same way. You want a culture that's conducive for learning. And so the environment in which they go into a school is an issue also. Higher expectations for teachers and parents, you know, uh, parental engagement, and then personal reasons, pregnancy, and things of that nature. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else you would, you would you would think would be up there, or you would add up there? You yeah, covered it pretty well. Those are the different reasons. Now let me ask you this: <clears throat> of the things up there, what are some of the things that an organization or a corporation? Uh, a United Way or church could actually help with those. What are, those, what, are those things, what are some of the things up there that we actually could, in the community, help with? Guest speakers, the classes. Okay, guest speakers, the classes, so you could actually motivate kids. Uh, we don't, you know, you all don't teach, you have a classroom, so you can't do much about the uh, interesting classes, right? What else could you help with, though? Anything else? Big brother, big sister type. Okay. And we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit also later. You can help with personal reasons, right? Depending on what the personal reasons are. Okay. And so, because like you're a big brother or a big sister, you can help with that. All right. Here's a statement from uh, Crit Lou Allen. Uh, when they did an audit of the Kentucky Department of Education, actually, I was in the Kentucky Department of Education when they did this, um, about dropout. Somebody read that for me. I'll do it, please. Can I do it? <laughs> Lack of educational attainment is the single biggest barrier to a stronger economic future for Kentucky. On an individual level, the costs are quantifiable. The National Alliance for Excellent Education estimates that the more than 18,000 students who did not graduate from Kentucky's high schools in 2004 will cost the state more than $4.8 billion over their lifetimes in lost wages, taxes, and productivity. Uh, does that open eyes? It's a lot of kids. We have about 670,000 kids in our schools in Kentucky. Now, even though they didn't graduate in 2004, it doesn't mean they didn't graduate in 2005. Okay. There may be a chance that 18,000 may drop, but it's still, it's probably still coming around 15,000 that we lose every year. Now what? What is it we can do? Um, the four-prong approach, there's one for the community. And I would say the, the one thing that has worked when I was in Tennessee, living in Ohio, and living in Kentucky, is mentoring. Research shows that when you mentor children, either group mentoring, school-based, 
uh, out of school mentoring works. And so anyone, uh, any adult, can mentor a child. And we know that the students have to do their part, the parents, the community, and the institutions. We're talking about schools and higher ed and things of that nature. So one of the things that we know that uh, businesses and corporations like Lexmark can do is like mentor kids. Uh, so here are some things that nature that you all could actually uh, participate in. Um, I'm pretty much after the $4.8 billion, I don't need to show you more about the cost of high school dropout. We know it costs. Okay, now, one of the things that <coughs> we have started uh, First Baptist Church Bragtown is a program called BMW Academy. And in 2005, we were working, um, our pastor's wife was working at Leestown Middle School. And at Leestown Middle School, um, the majority of kids who had been suspended, sent to the office, uh, in school suspension, were African American males. And so she sent a letter to all the parents and guardians of the African American males in that school. And so we're going to start a program at our church, and we're going to be involved. She had nine responses back. So she sent another letter out. you got to know our pastor's wife. She sent another letter out and saying, okay, I regret that you didn't get the first letter, okay, where we're asking to help your, your child become a better student, da, da, da. So we got about 15 or 16, okay. She said, no, I regret, and I have to shame you into getting involved in your child's education, yada, yada, yada. So we end up, the first year in 2005, 44 young men, okay? That's in 2005, we were housed at Leestown Middle School. Now we move that program to our church, and on average, we have about 135 boys every Saturday. And the program's designed to focus on academics and prepare them for college. And so... Um, a typical Saturday, if you came to our church on a Saturday morning, you would see probably about 125, 130 boys uh, focused on math, science, reading, uh, creative writing, a number of different things. And so we always had this thing called the power of stories. We have a, a, a man from the community talk about their story. For example, we had um, Phil Whippins, the guy that owns a number of McDonald's here. Well, he didn't always own McDonald's, he always was a millionaire. Okay, so he had bumps in the road and things of that nature and that kind of stuff. So he tells a story. We've always had somebody talk to them every Saturday for the last six and a half years. We don't miss. We meet every Saturday. Okay? The average ACT score for African American males in Kentucky is about 15.8. Our juniors and seniors over the last three years, average ACT score is like 21.4. So in other words, when you get the community involved, you get them focused and structured, these students can achieve academically, okay? And so, after going on for like uh, five years, uh, we did this pretty much without any money. It was just, you know, volunteering your time and things of that nature. And uh, Bill Farmer came uh, to Lexington and was uh, over the night away, and he came to myself, Bryce Aikens, and we talked about, he came and saw, and saw Saturday morning, we did, we had a lot of visitors, and I, uh, starting, August 27th, if you want to come visit and see what we do uh, for kids uh, on every Saturday, feel free. We get a lot of people to come see it. But he's like, well, how come this church and United Way uh, partner? And so between with Chase Bank and United Way, we received a grant, a STEM grant, Science, Technology, Energy, and Math, for our middle school kids. And if you can see some of the things they're doing with the STEM project, uh, I couldn't believe that and we're in partnership with UK also. So the first activity they had with these middle school kids were to build cool houses for penguins for global warming. I said, I don't think you're gonna get some kids to build a cool house for the penguins. They're not gonna do this. But there's a lot of science involved in this. And they had to first get the geographical location of things of that nature. They really got into it, they built this, then they went, did a shopping cart analysis, and they compared the prices of food on the south end of town, on the north end of town, and things of that nature. And also about health and how you eat. They realized that for you to eat healthy, it costs a lot. Another issue around attendance for kids is that if you don't eat healthy, okay, you tend to stay sick more, right? But if you're on public assistance, you can't buy, it's hard to buy whole foods then, versus, you know, Kroger. That's a different price. And so they studied all of this about eating healthy. And so 
they've been doing different projects now. They just uh, they're growing a garden out by our church. And they're going to grow peppers and tomatoes and all that kind of stuff, and then they're going to uh, sell salsa for a uh, um, fundraiser. So they do all these different things. We, like I said, we've been in existence for uh, almost seven years now. There's the ACT scores I was talking about, 2009. Now, what we call in higher ed our benchmark scores for reading to get into college in most universities, our state university, you need to have an 18 on the ACT. For math, they want you to have a 22. So look at the scores. First of all, our students need to ramp it up anyway in Kentucky overall. Um, but if you look at the scores, look where our young men are in Kentucky. And so we know that we spend time with children, regardless whether they white, black, Hispanic, whatever. If you spend time with children and you commit to them, they will rise to the occasion. But it's the partnership that's unique. I, I get to go to a lot of places doing training for teachers and principals all over the place. And it's a unique partnership. You have a church, United Way, a community organization, uh, Fayette County Public Schools. Okay? And a few other like, partnership in working with children. That's a unique partnership. And now we'll grab Lexmark, which you all helped also uh, in the past. You don't see that in a lot of cities. And you, and you do see it, you don't necessarily see it being as successful as we have it right here. And the other part we have is that our parents are really committed also. These are the expectations for the boys participate in our program on Saturdays. We tell them that you must read, turn the Wii off, turn the Xbox off, okay, and read. They all have to read. If you enter our program, we have our orientation on August 20th, and if you want to get in our BMW Academy, you have to read uh, Think Big by Ben Carson. Uh, anybody familiar with Ben Carson? No? Ed Shaker, yes? Who is it? He's a famous surgeon, okay? Um, and he grew up in Chicago, and his, he had, his mother had some of the same expectations uh, for him as we have for our boys here. And we tell them you have to read. You have to read on a regular basis. Um, and so here are some of the things we do uh, that we have to do on a regular basis on Saturdays. And that's the creed that they have. If you come to our, our program on Saturday, all you have to do is ask one of them, I need the creed. And they, they'll recite it instantly. Because we, we, we want kids to not just memorize it, we want them to internalize it. Because when you internalize something, it comes out in your behaviors and your actions. And so we have them read this, I mean say this, at any time. Uh, at school or whatever it is, we have them say the, the creed. And we also partnership with a number of different universities. Um, There's a good partnership. There's a major shortage of African American males at universities. And, and so we have this pool of African American males. Matter of fact, we had 21 seniors this year. When I say we have 135 African American males, I'm talking about a diverse group of African American males. We have kids who are maybe in special education. We have kids who make a 29 ACT, don't necessarily have a lot of social skills. Okay? And then we got a big middle group that have a lot of potential. And so we had 21 seniors this year. All 21 are going to college. They graduated this year. The year before that, we had about 13, all of them went to college. In six and a half years, we've had one kid that's been in our program drop out of school. And those seniors, he's the only one I know that's not in college right now. So the University of Kentucky, well, Georgetown College was the first college to come to um, our church one Sunday morning and commit 10 scholarships for any kid who will graduate with a 3.5 and I think a 24 on ACT. And then university came and they committed uh, uh, 10 scholarships, University of Kentucky, Morehead State committed five, Murray State committed 10. Um, and then you see Magic Johnson down there. We received a community service award uh, through the governor's office uh, two years ago. And it was funny because on a Saturday morning, Roz Akins asked uh, about seven boys to volunteer to go to Frankfurt with us to receive the award. They are all reluctant. I don't want to go. We got to dress up. We got to put clothes on. All that kind of stuff. <laughs> so we finally got about six or seven boys. We go to Frankfurt. Snow everywhere. We thought they were going to cancel it. They didn't cancel it. So they had it on Kentucky State's campus. 
And so we get the award and everything. And on our way back to Lexington, the governor's office calls Roz Akins and says, Magic Johnson's here. And the governor's wife has been to our program like three times to see it. Because uh, she's really pushing this issue around uh, increasing graduation rates. So she told the governor about our program. I guess the governor's telling Magic Johnson. So I guess she does this U-turn on 421, jets back to Frankfurt, okay? So they meet Magic Johnson, okay? And so they were telling about the program and all those things. Last year, year before last, we, we took 25 boys to Europe. Those who had a highest GPA, we took those kids to uh, Europe. But they had, we had to raise money for it. And so we were still trying to find spending money for these boys. And so Magic Johnson about that wrote a check, $10,000 on the spot to donate for his kids. Then he told all those boys who are there that he'll pay their way, full ride, any school they want to go to in the country. Now next time we ask the volunteers, <laughs> you know, we gotta fight them off. You know. Now everybody wants to go. And they, they volunteer and they said we tell them we want to go work in the, the Elway home and clean up. You know, so they they never know. But those are the partnerships and the guy that was, you know, money hangs with money. So the guy that was with Magic Johnson was one of the co-owners of Milwaukee Brewers. So he wrote a check also for those kids to go. Next year we're going to Italy. And we're going to take the top 20 kids with the top GPAs. We don't have any money. You know, well, not we're going to do it. You know, but we're going to do that. Our thing is that it's hard to be what you can't see. So every year they have to spend some time on a college campus from the 6th grade to 12th grade. And so our whole, whole, sole focus, our whole focus is on academics and getting college ready. And we take, we don't, we have our, right now our application process is going on and we, we, have, we have never turned down a kid at all. All they have to do is fill out the application, do an essay, and get a recommendation from a teacher or principal. But we never turn anyone down. So we, we had 21 kids graduate, we'll probably have about 115 coming back, we'll probably get about 50 uh, applications, maybe more, I'm not quite sure. Uh, and so, we need some money now. Anyway, <laughs> sidebar. Um, but the reason why it's, in, it's uh, successful is because of the commitment from their parents and the kids and those who work on Saturdays. Okay? I love to play golf, but, you know, from the Saturdays, from August till, you know, the time it gets cold, rarely I get to play in the morning because we're there at the church on Saturday morning working with kids. And the, the, good, the cool thing about it is when you see them graduate. So we have three that are juniors right now at University of Louisville, Murray State, and um, two at Murray State. And so they'll be graduating next year. And they were one of the first ones are sixth and seventh grades to start the program six or seven years ago. And so when you partner with United Way and other folks, you see good things happen. And that's kind of like one of the partnerships we have is uh, with United Way and the focus is on the students. We don't have adult conversations. It's not about the adults, it's not about First Baptist Church of Bragtown is not about United Way, it's about the children. And then the United Way, Fayette County Public Schools, and ourselves put forth the effort to make sure kids are successful. Okay. Is it working? Yes. Um, the kids are graduating. The first year we had it in 2005, and our kids are constantly getting suspended, you know, in school suspension, out of school suspension. Behavior is not an issue anymore, not an issue at all. Uh, matter of fact, every time we go on a college tour, everyone, they want to know where we're from. They always first think we're from the Boys Harlem Choir. I don't know why. Especially uh, <laughs> for me, because you know I can't sing. But anyway, they ask, they, the first thing is like, where you're from? We tell them, Lake Kentucky. Okay? And then they are so well behaved. Well, they're so well behaved, that's our expectation. You know, it's, you know that's, it's not an option. You're going to act like you belong to somebody. You know, the parents are not with them. Matter of fact, we took them to D.C. and they were dressed so nice. They had shirt, tie, vest, things of that nature. We had about 50 of them. And we're up there standing outside the, the White House. And the lady comes up, okay, and says, where are you all from? You're so well behaved, da 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 Would you like a private uh, tour of the White House? Okay? She's like assistant director of the CIA. And uh, it took about three hours, because they had to get background checks, they had to get them all their social security numbers, all that kind of stuff. It's about five o'clock tour in the White House, personal tour. But all because how they were behaving, how they looked, how they carried themselves. You know, that take, you know, that carries a lot. But they still got to produce. Bottom line is it's working through a partnership. Uh, the takeaways, 
uh, it is an, uh, an epidemic. Uh, uh, I just want to open your eyes that we are losing a lot of kids, and we're not concerned about what they look like, their gender, their ethnicity. When you lose kids, it's going to hurt everyone, directly and indirectly. Uh, we know with African American males, it's probably double than any other group of students. And so we have to we focus on those kids. Uh, it's an economic and a social drain, you know. True story. I'm working at Cincinnati Public Schools. And I coached basketball in middle school. Uh, this is like in 97, I think. So I moved to Murfreesboro, Tennessee in 98. So I, I came to Cincinnati to visit my mother and him. So I love this, they had this little restaurant in the West End of Louisville, I mean West End of Cincinnati, right where they had the riots in, in the late 90s. So it's, you know, it's dark, and it was one of my friends, and we're going to the restaurant. Three kids approach us. You know, they said, check it in, check it in, and said, give me your money. You know, they're going to rob us. You know, they're, they're, rob, they're just practicing to rob me because I didn't have any money anyway. Uh, <laughs> And so when they started talking, I'm looking, I was like, this looks like Corey Blink, I want to say his name. I was like, Corey? He's like, Mr. Cleveland. <laughs> I haven't seen him in like five years. I said, boy, what are you doing? Oh, I didn't know. I'm sorry. He's a poly you know, some, you know, somebody going to rob somebody. He's apologizing to me. The point is, you never know who you're going to run into. You can pay now, or you can pay later. Because those kids, he had to talk the other kids into, like, I know him. He was my teacher. That day, he's my counselor. You know, you never know. So the same kids, we, we probably have one kid in our BMW Academy, okay? If he's not, not going to be the next president when he, when he gets a little older, okay, it's not because of lack of effort. He's the one that made a 29 on ACT his freshman year. Now he made a 31, okay? I mean... We have all kinds of, we have a very diverse group of kids. <clears throat> but it can't be a social drain on the community if we don't take care of it. Yeah. It's our, primarily it's our responsibility as educators, but we also need outside help to help us. And um, we all play a role in eradicating the dropout phenomenon. All right, that's it. So we talked about the what was, the dropout phenomenon, uh, the so what, what are the implications for that, how's it going to impact uh, all of us, whether you're in education or not, and the um, the now what? What are we going to do about it? So everybody can serve a role, mentoring or whatever. And I'm sure the folks in the United Way can give you all some ideas also. All right, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, when you first started, it was hard to get the parents involved, you know, the three letters, yep. and then they got involved, and it sounds like more and more getting involved. What was the, what was the difference in the parents that made some interested and others not? Um, well, that's, in any schools, it's hard to get parent involvement, and definitely when you go from elementary to middle to high, you know, you know, kids only want to see their parents near a high school. You know, drop me off four blocks away. You know, I don't want you driving up, and you know, my friends see me with you, and all that kind of stuff. So in general, that's any kid. Okay, so in middle school, it's sort of way it just drops off. You drop your kid off in kindergarten, you're crying. You know, you drop them off in middle school, they're crying because they don't want you to be around. So to get them involved in general is a problematic. But the thing that uh, was, I think, critical for us was that the kids wanted to be in the program, and we don't, we don't provide transportation. We don't pick them up. We're going to drop them off. So the only way they're going to get there is the parents. And so the kids put the pressure back on the parents. I want to go to BMW Academy on Saturdays. And the other thing is that, uh, and so that was part of the motivation, put the pressure back on the parents. Now we have parents that uh, we have a parent advisory committee. They, uh, they do kind of quite, quite a bit. But one of the things I failed to mention is that um, we have 135 boys. The two things we don't talk about is the NBA and the NFL. <laughs> the only time they touch a basketball is we have what we call Cats Night. We're getting ready for the, um, the state assessment, which is called Cats. They, we get them prepped all week long, and on Thursday night, the UK players will come men's and women's team and play basketball with them. After we, we get ready for the test. And then right now we're in our summer program with STEM. All the middle school uh, kids are there. We do a, a five week summer program where they play basketball after two hours of studying science and math and things of that nature. And so uh, we've seen our math score. And we're, you know, we're so focused on math and science that we, we 
processing our writing score slipped a little bit. So now we have to use writing there also. But um, the parents are because they're the kids put the pressure on them a little bit. Not anymore. It's we don't think we can worry about that anymore. Is that because the parents have seen the success and they have... Well, that's the other thing. They've seen the success and they also see that, you know, if you get through this program for six years and you get some decent grades and an ACT score, you can possibly go to school for free. That's a motivator. <laughs> yeah. And we also have a growth program also. Uh, started about two and a half years after um, the BMW Academy. And, and so they're just really getting started. But some of the scholarships will go to the girls also. Anything else? Yes, sir. Clarify, so you all just get together as a group on Saturday, or is this a full week thing? No, nah, just Saturday as well. It was just Saturdays until we received a STEM grant through Chase and United Way. And so on Tuesdays and Thursdays during the, uh, the week, they focus on science and math. But before that, we just met on Saturdays. But it was every Saturday. And most programs don't sustain themselves that long. You know, it's, um, they'll go for like a year and a half. And then, because the one reason why it's not popping up, I think, in, in the city and other places because you got to be committed, you know, and there's a big, distinct difference between being involved and being committed. You come in every now and then, you're involved, you're there every Saturday, you're committed. So sort of like when you know, I had breakfast this morning, eggs and bacon, the chicken was involved and the pig was committed, okay? <laughs> Some of you guys sacrifice, we sacrifice our time. <laughs> get a little slow, I don't know about it. <laughs> All right. Yes, ma'am. Are you 100% run by volunteers? Up until the STEM grant, uh, it was all volunteers, the first five and a half years. With the STEM grant, we can pay teachers. And before the, the volunteers, we had a few from uh, Fayette County Public Schools. As a matter of fact, we had three or four from Lafayette, very good teachers. And they volunteer at times. Some of the students from my class, uh, they do observations anyway, so they'll, they'll, they'll volunteer. But majority of people are volunteers, especially during the, on Saturdays, they're volunteers. Now we on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we can't pay uh, some of the teachers. It's not a lot of money, but we pay probably gas money at best. And they would do it whether we pay them or not. Yeah. Where, where does you pull most of your students from? They come from all five high schools and all 11 middle schools. They come from the Learning Center, which is an alternative program. They come from the Monmouth Academy, which is an alternative school. We have two kids that come from Lawrenceburg. We have one kid that comes from uh, Danville, one that comes from Woodford County, and one that comes from Clark County. Uh, so they come from pretty much all over Central Kentucky. How do you get the word out? I mean, besides word of mouth. That's pretty much it. Well, now that we have the application process going on, we've been on the um, uh, KET, we've been on a couple of radio stations, that kind of stuff. But I say 90% is word of mouth. And now United Way is uh, promoting this, uh, these kinds of things. So, uh, but mostly word of mouth. You know, I'm scared to advertise, but we have 150. I don't, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, everybody shows up, you get 250. I don't know what's going to happen. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that was the same question. Oh, okay. I was wondering if it was surrounding counties or just Fayette County. The primary focus is on Fayette County Public Schools. But like I said, we haven't turned down anyone. So, um, Ross Agnes does not know how to say no. Uh, I'm trying to teach her how to do that. Because you don't want to get too many kids that will get watered down. And we, you know, will be spread so thin that you know the instruction and things they receive on Saturdays and Tuesdays and Thursdays will, you know, will not be effective. So we don't want to. Uh, but the biggest piece is all of those relationships, the kind of relationships you have with the children. Yes, sir. So considering, I mean, this is obviously such a widespread epidemic. Are there some aspects of that particular program that you can use to work with um, the public schools that, to implement? Oh yeah, we share um, we share some of the strategies that one of the things that. Um, uh, Stu Silverman's been out there probably about 25 times, and we presented to the principals in their principal meetings and some of the strategies that we use. Um, you know, we dispel the myth that white female teachers cannot teach African American males, because probably our best tutor or teacher on Saturday mornings is a white female, and she has all African American males, and she teaches geometry, trig, and calculus, and their scores are going like this. So we share those strategies that she's using teachers and principals things like that. Try to build capacity because you know we want to impact more than 135, 150 kids. I assume it's kind of alluding to get how you spread it out to build capacity up. So that's one way. We do a lot of people ask us to come to other states and present our program. We do quite a bit of that also. Anything else? Do you know of any other programs in Kentucky or surrounding states that have modeled themselves? In Kentucky 
in Kentucky, we've had a, a, a few churches that, that came down, and now they've replicated in Covington. They have a program. In E-Town, they have a program. That, matter of fact, the guy just called me from Danville yesterday. He wants me to come down there to their church and start and help them start something like that. There's a, a, a considerable amount of programs around the country, but a lot of them are tied directly to schools. And, uh, but there's some. There was a couple in Louisville. Um, I think the success of ours is the one where a lot of people are coming to visit things of that nature. So there are a few around. Not as many in Kentucky. Though. Yes? Do you do any kind of religious instruction while you're at it? I mean, you are a church. Yes. When we're in Leestown, you know, we couldn't do that. You know, you got to separate church and state. Yeah. Uh, but once we moved into our church, we did have one piece called Dare to Be a Daniel. And that was what we called a hip hop Bible study. So we had one of our Michael Robinson would come in, one of our younger ministers who's gone now. He would do the Bible study with the boys, but he would connect the scripture and things like that to what's going on in the hip hop community. And so he make it so they're engaged and things that he did a great job. We haven't done that in a while, but we, we do that the kind of thing also. We don't force them to go to church and all that kind of stuff. Matter of fact, of the kids who are in our program right now, only like six go to our church. So these are kids from all over the community. And that's the other difference. That usually there's a program within the church, it's usually their kids they're working with. These are kids that, you know, the only time we see them usually is Saturday or we're taking them somewhere. They don't go to our church. Yes, sir? Anything more specific to just the individuals of Saturday? Do you guys break them, break them up into, like, Subject specific, or yes. That's, you have a lot of volunteers. Like yeah, uh, now we don't have a lot of volunteers, but we do break them up. Uh, a typical Saturday will look, we'll have uh, because we have the STEM grant. We'll have all the middle school kids together, and so we'll have, we'll have this, uh, one side of the room is a very large room like this. One side will be all sixth and seventh graders, and then the eighth graders. So the sixth and seventh graders may do something around science. Eighth graders may be doing something around math. The freshmen. You know, we don't know who do with freshmen anyway. We, uh, they may be working on African American history. The sophomores may be doing creative writing. The juniors, the seniors are always doing, the juniors are always doing ACT prep, but it's tied in reading, math, science, and things of that nature. And the seniors may be doing something, uh, we may be doing college grades, but we do enrichment stuff also, just not academics. You know, we talk, we, we, everybody plays chess. We teach everybody to play chess. We did golf one year and that kind of stuff. A lot of things they're not usually uh, uh, have access to. So a typical day, they're all broken down to grade level and then content. And then we rotate every 45 minutes. Because usually the average high school class is like 55 minutes. We're trying to move away from like school-like and have some fun. Yesterday uh, in the STEM, um, on Tuesday, in the science part, they made ice cream. You know, but through science instruction, you know, they made ice cream. So we try to make it fun and things of that nature, you know. Uh, there's an old adage that says that elementary teachers love their students, middle school and high school teachers love their subjects, and professors love themselves. So in other words, the higher you go, it's all about you. <laughs> and the people that we have, though, it's all about the children. You know, sorry, teachers, it's a joke. Okay? Um, it is true to some degree, though. <laughs> Making run over a teacher park in high school, you know, the elementary day there all day long. Uh, anything else? I'm going to take up all your time. Your lunch. Yes, sir. What about um, like Hispanic students or other groups of pe people? Would they, could they apply, or is there any program similar that would? Uh, now, if they apply, we'll probably let them in. Yeah. But I think the the the, uh, the thing you might add is that this program is for African American males. Right. But if somebody applied, you know, we'll let any kids in. Because there's some kids, uh, uh, white kids in our church, a couple of kids go to Bryan Station. Matter of fact, they're both been in for the reason they didn't participate. Um, but we have a lot of, uh, we have people that have come from Hazard and Paintsville. They're having trouble with their boys, the Appalachian boys and things of that nature. And so it can be replicated and make a difference with ethnicity is to some degree. We do push, we need, they need, you know, we think they need to learn their, their culture, which is critical, and, and things of that nature. But with the exception of that, everything we do, it doesn't make a difference with what the ethnicity is for the most part. Or, you know, although the gender is a little bit, the boys are a little different from girls and how they learn, but um, but getting back to that, I don't know if there's anything uh, similar to that. Uh, not that I know of. I mean, not in Lexington. I think there are some places in uh, other cities. Yeah. But, you know, our thing is that whoever wants help, they participate. Yeah. What, what are your all's biggest needs as a group right now? Um, volunteers, a reference to teaching, so um, uh, the, the classes would be a little smaller. 
right now it could easily be, you know, 12 or 14 kids in the classroom, and that's too much like school. So, you know, seven or eight would be, you know, a little nice. And then a lot of times, if you volunteer, let's say you're an engineer at Lexmark, or you're an engineer, but you're not necessarily a teacher. So we don't want you to give you 18 kids, you know. So the smaller group and things like that. We have, we have people from Lexmark that has uh, volunteered before, and what they do is the hands-on is, is relevant to the kids based on some of the things you all do. And that's why they're so engaged. Uh, uh, so I would say probably the tutoring. And like if you're a, if you have a math background or a science background, even though you're not a teacher, you can help. You have to be certified to help kids. You think about it. The Titanic was built by professionals. The Ark was built by amateurs. Which one lasts the longest? So you have to be a professional teacher to help kids. So anytime the volunteers are teaching, makes the group smaller, we're probably going to be more effective. So are you coming, officer? <laughs> Get on tape. <laughs> I'm 27. <laughs> uh, else? I know it's time to go. I think we're good. All right. Thanks for all your attention. I'd like to thank all of you for being here this afternoon for the uh, lunch and learn. It's uh, programs like Dr. Cleveland talked about the STEM program that are helping students and helping kids in our community and it's because of the help that you give to United Way and uh, stuff but it has a direct connection so we hope you uh, enjoyed this afternoon uh, found this very beneficial and look forward to seeing you again at the next lunch and learn and again let's give Mr. Dr. Cleveland a round of applause Thank you. I'll turn it back over to you is that, or is it? Uh, yeah. okay. So the only thing, just before we wrap up, I had put a few dates out there regarding the campaign this year. Um, we have another Lunch and Learn session coming up next month. Um, that would be with CASA, um, which is a United Way agency here in our community. Um, you'll hear more about that. We've got our golf scramble coming up August 22nd, and then we'll have the kickoff in September. Um, one thing we're doing to prepare for the kickoff this year is we're making a video and um, it's going to be lots of fun. There's dancing involved and we're recruiting volunteers to participate in this video. So if you have any interest in um, getting yourself caught on film, doing something fun for a good cause, please contact Bart Mansdorf <laughs> because you get a free t-shirt and you'll get free lunch if you participate in the video. And we will be doing this on August 4th in the big conference center. So you'll hear more about that too. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming today. Thank you everyone.